Oliver, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I've been uh, talk, talking about JFK uh, Revisited, which is coming out on Showtime this next Monday. Yeah, I've uh, had a chance to check out the documentary because I have Showtime anywhere. And boy, was I blown away by these two hours. What was your goal with JFK Revisited? To leave something behind, of a legacy piece. It was a huge event and had tremendous meaning for the world still today. And uh, we wanted to focus on what has come out since the film was released in 1991. And a lot has come out because they appointed a congressional investigation uh, of citizens called the Assassination Records Review Board. And they sat for four years, 94 to 98. And they released quite a bit. Of, they declassified a lot of stuff that was not paid any attention to by the media. So we went there and we, bit by bit, it's important stuff. We just bring it to the attention of the public. You have to see the film to fully understand the scope of this thing. But it's incredible. Are, I, I'm probably going to have to watch it three or four times just to, for everything to really start to sink in. There is so much information. And before we get into some of those details, I'm curious if my math is correct, you were around 17. Uh, you were the age of 17 when JFK was assassinated in Dallas. That's obviously a memorable event for anyone who had consciousness on November 22nd, 1963. Uh, how did you find out about the news and what was that next week like for you? Well, nothing special. I was 17. I was conventional thinking, and we were ter we were shocked. Everybody, at the I was in boarding school, so we were enclosed in a community, and we saw it on television. We had the usual reactions. We went through that whole week. It was quite stunning, but I think I was way too young to understand what had really happened, and we bought the whole story. But I didn't really go back to it until 1988 when I was working I, I bought a book by Jim Garrison and I started to look into the case. So 88 was the first time that you really su started to suspect that the official narrative was incorrect. That's correct. 88, 89. I'd, I'd, of course, I'd heard about all the, the, the protests against it, but I hadn't, I hadn't dipped into it. And you did a good job of starting to expose why that official narrative was wrong with your movie, JFK, of course. Um, and there are some glaring inconsistencies with regards to the Warren Commission, what they said happened and what actually happened. Is there any one piece of information that you and your research team uncovered when looking at these declassified documents that just further dams that Warren Commission report? Yeah, you can't limit it to one piece of information. There's several pieces of information, but certainly we even look at the Warren Commission itself, how it was constructed. We find out that there's meetings or mis uh, notes notes on the last meeting, the last two meetings are missing, missing. And there was dissent in the committee and there was not, that was not revealed to the American public. And we talk about the dissent issues on the bullets. And we talk about who's on the commission, Alan Dulles, guess what? He was fired by Kennedy, he was the head of the CIA. So it looks very much like the CIA is all around this case. And Dulles does his best to keep the CIA informed of what's going on at the same time to kind of stonewall the Warren Commission on what the information they had. They never told, for example, they never told the Warren Commission that they were deeply involved in plots to kill uh, Castro in Cuba, as well as uh, other presidents and leaders in other countries. They didn't know, how, they weren't dealing with that. And of course that, it, that crosses over into the Kennedy case. Yeah, and Alan Dulles is a very vile character in American history, of course, leading the CIA. And you also showed old footage of him talking as a member of the Warren Commission. He almost had this smug nature about him as he was discussing what it was that they were looking at and what it was they were supposedly uncovering throughout the process as well. No, Dulles was, was so smug. You see it in his the, the interview pieces we do with him, the little clips and his attitude was one of, look, we're the, we're the men who've run this World War II, the, we're the Eisenhower generation. My brother, John Foster, was, in, was, head of, was State Department, Secretary of, De, of State for the country. He knew about, he was adamantly anti-communist. We are, America should be. He thought he knew how to run the country, what was best for the country, because they weren't operating with full they weren't giving all the information they were doing, all the things they were doing in the 1950s, they, never, they didn't reveal it. They were, they were dealing in, with a, a sort of mantle of secrecy around them that had been sanctified by the nature of their work. 
So they didn't really tell President Eisenhower or Truman really the things that were going on. And Dulles, uh, 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 the, other, the older Dulles uh, Secretary of State was famous for that. He, he decided policy. Nick Eisenhower was surprisingly weak with him. It's a whole story. You should read about it in uh, David Talbot's book, uh, Ch Devil's Chessboard. It's the story of the two brothers, Dulles brothers. And his other book, uh, Brothers, is about uh, Bobby and uh, Jack. And that came out earlier in 2007. It's a very good book. What is chain of custody and why is it important with regards to the magic bullet theory? Because it can be thrown out of court. Chain of custody is crucial. Without chain of custody, you have nothing in court. So there is no, Oswald's case would have been dismissed on day one. He wouldn't have, it, it's a joke because there's no, as we show the bullet, the rifle, fingerprints, it's all wrong. There's nothing, nothing, even the, the, where the rifle was bought and where the rifle is, the sling, not one thing, uh, one piece of original evidence can hold up. And we also go into the issue of where Oswald was. We find three secretaries who were declassified as late as 2000. Three secretaries uh, were on the fourth floor, saw everything, ran down the stairs right away within a minute, faster than that. And they never saw Oswald on those stairs. And these are uh, secretaries, they don't miss, you know, they're very punctual, <laughs> they're very smart. And the older supervisor also went to the top of the stairs, looked down Dorothy Garner, and she never saw Oswald either. So where was Oswald? He was on the first floor from the beginning. That's right, Vicki well, Adams' well, testimony, which well, was well, out well, destroyed well, by well, the Warren Commission. So again, yeah, they changed her, their testimony. They didn't use all of their testimony. They just used, they said that she was mistaken. And it was uh, she she left about a minute after the assassination. About a minute after. Was there anything fishy about the FBI's files on Oswald leading up to November 22nd, 1963? We, the fingerprints of intelligence are all over those files. And now we know that from the declassifications, we know that Oswald was a special project. He was kept apart. His file disappears. He had no 201. He was kept on a, in, a, in a secret file by the head of counterintelligence, uh, James Angleton. He was kept. And then right before the assassination, his, his name was taken off the flash list. Normally he would have been picked up in, uh, or interrogated in Dallas as a possible threat to the president. His name doesn't appear. Secret Service had no record of him. And then of course the Secret Service destroyed its files, some of its files when the Assassination Records Report asked them in 95 to see that they wanted to see about the trips that Kennedy had made to uh, Chicago and Tampa prior to, the, to, to uh, the, the assassination, because there were similar, similar sightings, similar t information about a, an Oswald type in Chicago who was going to perform the assassination from a high office building as, a, as the car turned in from a, off the uh, parade route. And then also in Tampa, there was a high building with a, with a, a suspect, a, a Cuban suspect who was there. So you see, these things are very strange, but it seems like there was a pattern, set up a pattern. The president was going to be killed that fall in the South or in, in the North, if necessary. But Chicago was called off. Kennedy called off the trip, but he went ahead with Tampa and nothing happened in Tampa. Who are Drs. Kemp Clark and doctors, uh, Dr. Malcolm Perry? And why is their story one that not more people know about, especially the press conference that they held shortly after the president's death? Yeah, all that information is available because they said right away, the first thing they do is try to save his life. There, there was a wound in his throat, possibly a bullet. It was a bullet, but probably, possibly it was a flechette. We don't know. And they performed a tracheotomy there to, to let him breathe. That was the first thing they did. And if you look at the picture in the... Uh, in the Zapruder film, you see the first thing Kennedy does after he comes out from the side is he holding his throat, indicating a shot from the front. Uh, that becomes a key issue because if there's a shot from the front, there's definitely more than one shooter. There's a front and a back. And the same thing is true about another shot. When you see his head blown off, it's clearly from the front because he's falling back and to the left. It's a, he's taking a hit from the front, which people say is from the... Uh, the grassy you knoll, the, the, where the fence was. Okay, so right away you have these two bullets are very questionable, and the Warren Commission wants to make the case that there were three bullets, and they were fired by these uh, by one man from the rear, 
it's very, it's impossible to make that case. And the, the, these two doctors knew that from day one. It was awesome. Crenshaw knew it too. Perry was the most conflicted because he got the most pressure and he got it right away. We talk about that in the film. The nurse who knew him the best says how miserable he was because the, FB, the uh, FBI put pressure on him to change his testimony and say that the shot came from the rear, but he knew it was from the front. And we have a scene where the, one of the doctors years later is in an operating room with him and they talk about, after the operation, they talk about Perry releases, says very clearly the shot was from the front. They're very important people, but they were ignored, as was everybody else. So JFK's foreign policy is uh, certainly a big reason why the powers that be may no, longer, no, may no longer have wanted him around. What were his thoughts on the U.S. troop situation in Vietnam in the early 1960s, considering what happened in that country later that decade? Huge story. Clearly from the front, I mean, uh, clearly from the declassified files, we now know proof proof that uh, he was going to withdraw from Vietnam. It was at the sec death meeting in May. McNamara wanted the troops, the first thousand troops out faster. He wanted the units out. He didn't want individual soldiers. And the plan was to withdraw everything in 65, but not to announce it because it was a public relations thing. He didn't want to run for office with a, against the right wing Goldwater pulling out of Vietnam. But he made the intention, he made his intention clear he was not going to send tr ground troops into Vietnam and he didn't he sent advisors and there were advisors there you can fault him for that but he was under tremendous pressure as a young president there was a desire for war in Vietnam very clearly and he fought them all the way never never committed to troops never nor in, against Cuba either when the Bay of Pigs happened or the missile crisis he didn't go to war in Cuba he didn't go to war in Vietnam and he was fighting, he was working for a detente with Khrushchev of Russia, because after the missile crisis in 62, they were talking and there was an opening and they, both men were sane and they, they felt like we're really, this is really out of control. Not only from where the most danger is from our hardliners, the hardliners against Kennedy and in the, in the Pentagon, the CIA, and the hardliners against Khrushchev in Moscow. So they both felt very special. They understood the dangers of what we were facing. And it's through those two men that we basically, and Robert Kennedy, that we're basically saved. I think there would have been a nuclear war because it was, there was more nuclear weapons in Cuba than we knew. And there was uh, 4,000 Russian, advisor, Russian advisors in there. So you have quite a story here. Anyway, they saved the world, in my opinion. They saved the world. How do we now know that the autopsy photos were even staged? Well, because we, we show, again, uh, by the way, I just on the on the Vietnam, Robert McNamara wrote a book after the film came out, and he said very clearly that Kennedy was pulling out, win or lose. As to, uh, I'm sorry, what the, oh, this, the, uh, the photographer? Yes. You're talking about the autopsy photos? Well, the autopsy photos are very strange. Uh, those come from Bethesda, but <laughs> the photographer who's shooting the autopsy, John Stringer, made a statement to the, to the Records Review Board, and he said, those are not my photographs. Certain of these photographs were doctored. They were changed, including the shot from the, of the head, of the back of the head on the right side. That's where 40, 50 people had seen this huge wound. The brains had, the brains had come out of the, out of the head. The, it was dripping cerebellum in the, in the, in the, off, in the hospital floor. There was dripping cerebellum on the car. When the, he shot in the car, you see the skull piece fly off. You see Jackie Kennedy trying to get it back in his, trying to put his head back together. And the brain <laughs> that, they, uh, that they weighed at the so-called autopsy weighs a normal, is a normal brain. That's impossible if, you, if your brain has been opened and you're spilling your brain out. So something happened. Stringer said, that's not my photograph. And he proved it because it wasn't even the film he was using. So this is a very sloppy job of, fixing up the back of his head very sloppy and uh, there's other shots too but those are a lot of details but definitely the photographer did not shoot those shots you asked three very pointed questions in your jfk and, film why was he killed who benefited from it and who had the power to cover it up who do you think benefited the most from jfk no longer being around well the intelligence agencies they continued to they have their own kingdom their autonomy also the pentagon we went to war in vietnam very quickly 
we were at war by 65. Johnson, oh, and, but there we show another, another very interesting conversation we have in the phone is when uh, Lyndon Johnson's talking to McNamara. I, I hope you heard that when he says, you know, he says to McNamara, now he's president and McNamara is working for him as Secretary of Defense. He says, you know, I was against the plan of you and, your, you and the president to withdraw from Vietnam to withdraw from Vietnam. He said that point blank. So Johnson was a completely different mindset. He was a cold warrior. We are, we are gonna win in Vietnam. We're not gonna back down on the comp from the communists was his attitude. Kennedy was a warrior for peace, whereas Johnson went right to war and nothing changed in American foreign policy. It got worse. And we stayed in wars, by the way. You can look at the whole history of the trace from Vietnam to Iran, to Iraq, uh, to uh, Afghanistan and on and on and on. Now, Barr McClellan has written a couple of really good books that uh, just lays out the case for how complicit LBJ was in this assassination as well. Highly recommend. Who does? Uh, Barr McClellan is his name. His father, I believe, was one of LBJ's primary attorneys and uh, told him a lot of information over time. And LBJ, of course, did not last long once his presidency was over with. And according to those closest to him, he died with the weight of the world on him, with the amount of guilt that he felt for uh, the events that he helped put into action. I, we don't know that. Uh, Johnson is complicit in the cover-up for sure. There was a general feeling that Kennedy had been killed by some forces, okay? And there was a fear, there was a tension in Washington. And certainly Johnson is, a, is complicit in covering it up because he didn't want any trouble. He feared and he feared a war with Russia and Cuba. He didn't want to have a war. That's what, he moved away from that, and for that he should be commended. But still, he 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 look, overlooked a lot of things that he could have done to make to really investigate this case. Appointing the Warren Commission was a terrible idea. Anyway, uh, no, I, I can't. I don't know that. I do know there's two crimes. There's a assassination, and I think that it was a smaller group and it's controlled. And I think there's a cover up, which is wide. And that was wide. Oliver Stone is a four time Academy Award winning filmmaker, author of one of the best books of 2020, Chasing the Light, writing, directing and surviving Platoon, Midnight Express, Scarface, Salvador and the movie Game. And he's the director of the brand new documentary JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. It premieres on Showtime tonight, November 22nd, the 58th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination in Dallas. Please do check it out. It's maybe as important as anything that he has ever put out there. Oliver, thank you so much for the time today. Thank and you, thank you for this very important film. Thank you very much.